thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I know you guys have, uh, it's been an interesting uh, period here in uh, Ireland, and I figure I can help cheer you up by uh, distracting you with uh, a picture of perhaps worse problems uh, globally in our global system. And um, actually, maybe one way to start is with a little uh, lesson in engineering. The, um, the top ship was a ship that was actually built in 1858. It was called the Great Eastern. And this ship uh, it was a pi super pioneering ship. It had about uh, it had three different modes of uh, propulsion. It had uh, a stem to stern bulkhead deck. It was the first, I think, double hulled ship in the world. It had 14 different compartments. This was a ship that was built never to sink, 1858. In 1862, this ship hit a rock off of Montauk Point. That rock is still, uh, even to this day, is called the Great Eastern Rock. The uh, ripped a gash about 100 feet long in the Great Eastern. A couple of the compartments fell with water. They uh, managed to get the ship into port. They repaired it, spent the next 40 years going back and forth across the Atlantic laying cable. The other ship, some of you may re uh, recognize, that's the Titanic. This is built, launched in 1912, and uh, you know the engineers decided to uh, make it a little bit more efficient, make it a little bit more consumer friendly. So they got rid of a few things. Now we all recollect that they maybe got rid of a few too many of the lifeboats, but they also got rid of. One of the most important things they got rid of is the thing called the uh, bulkhead deck. So even though they had compartments in the Titanic, there was a little problem is, you know, when they actually got, when Ballard got to the bottom of the sea, we'd always been, you know, heard that there was a giant gash in the side of the uh, Titanic. What they actually found out is that the, what had happened is there was no gash, there was just this period, a place where the, the, the plates had buckled you know, and the water rushed in. The problem was that when the water got to the top of the first of the compartments, because they got rid of the bulkhead deck, the water just kind of went over into the second compartment, and then when it got to the top of the second compartment, the third compartment, and the ship just went down straight to the bottom. Now the difference is this is a system, you know, that's in which you can localize risk, keep it localized. Now this is a system in which risk is globalized, in which a disaster in one place is a disaster every place. Let's see. There we go. So how, this is how I got into this. You know, some years back I was running a magazine called Global Business, and there was this event. This was 1999 in Taiwan. There was an earthquake. It was quite large. It killed about 2,500 people. And uh, it, uh, within a couple of days, this is what was strange about it. Because normally you think, okay, earthquake in Taiwan, it's bad. You know, uh, we feel bad for the folks there. We, you know, we'll send them some assistance. The difference was that within about three or four days, all of these factories all across the United States shut down. Now, as it turned out, they were mainly computer factories, and what had happened is that uh, it, we were determined relatively quickly that there was these a bunch of semiconductor chips that came out of this one town in Taiwan called Xinju, and uh, these were being transported across the ocean on a just-in-time basis. There was almost no capacity, I mean, there was almost no uh, backup supply any place. And the break, what had happened is this earthquake had it hadn't actually taken out any of the factories, hadn't just uh, even sort of damaged any of the factories. What it had done is it had uh, disrupted power to the airports and ports, couldn't move stuff in and out, couldn't move these chips across the sea in a just-in-time basis. So you had essentially an industrial crash. This is really the world's first major industrial crash. 
It only lasted for about a week because within a week they got the airports open. They were able to fly the semiconductors across the sea. They were able to reopen these factories. What had had it lasted longer, however, it wouldn't have just been the computer factories, the Dells and Compacts that would have gone down. It would have been all of Detroit would have gone down. All of uh, Boeing would have gone down. Caterpillar would have gone down. Any these are like a particular type of chip. It's these programmable chips. They go into almost any kind of industrial product that has complex um, uh, IT needs. So uh, this was, in 1999, was the first major industrial crash. And um, you know it's important for us to actually understand what this really meant. Because you know this is actually a way to sort of understand what happened. It was like, that's Taiwan over on the side. And then you take Taiwan out, and then the system goes down. This is actually not a, a one-off event. You know, that was 1999. Since then, after September 11, there was a, uh, we saw a shutdown of a number of industrial systems in the United States because of the closure of the borders with Canada and with Mexico, and because of the, 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 the stand down with all the airplanes. We didn't notice at the time. We had other things to think about. Uh, with the near war, there are a couple times in 2001, 2002, when the Pakistanis and the Indians uh, almost went to war with nuclear weapons. That was a case in which the uh, companies like General Electric, which had outsourced a whole bunch of their back office operations to India, said, oh my gosh, if this war actually happened, all of this information that we're importing in the United States on a just-in-time basis, we won't have access to it. We, General Electric, will go down. Citibank would have gone down. Um, that was, didn't actually happen. The, uh, SARS also, another case in which you saw incipient breakdowns of the trading system. The, uh, more recently, we've seen it um, with the banking sector. I mean, with the banking crash, a uh, financial crash in September 2008. After that happened, there was all of these sort of shocks that went out across these industrial systems. People are just starting to study this now in some depth, looking at how the shock was transmitted, in some cases amplified by the industrial, the present structure of the industrial system. The bailout of Detroit, to some extent, was based on the fact that what had happened is you had a whole bunch of suppliers. If, if, if General Motors had gone down suddenly, Suppliers would have gone down suddenly. If suppliers had gone down suddenly, you would have seen every other automotive firm in the United States go down suddenly. And we have to remember, if you have that kind of a crash, getting it back up is not so easy. The, um, just to give you a little sense of how it works, these are, those are um, uh, piston rings. And, uh, July of 2007, in Niigata, Japan, there was an earthquake. Within about four or five hours, all 12 major vehicle manufacturers in Japan shut down after this earthquake. You know, I spent the summer of 2008 in Japan sort of talking to people within the automotive system there, within the government. And uh, you know, uh, what had happened, this is actually what a a very illustrative event because there's this famous study which uh, when has been, you know, most people who look at industrial risk uh, know this. There was a fire in the Toyota system in, 2000, in 1997 in this brake, uh, this company called ASIN which made these little uh, valves for brakes. And at that point, the, the, uh, the entire uh, Toyota system went down around Nagoya. So Toyota couldn't build cars. They didn't build any cars for about 10 days. Within, um, but they got everyone together. They figured out how to rebuild this factory. A fire is very destructive. They you know, got the, um, you know, uh, they f figured out how to make the, these, um, um, rebuild the machinery quite quickly. They got the system going back up. And they said afterwards, you know, OK, we lost we, the capacity to build this many cars for this period of time. But over the course of a year, this event is going to disappear. And the fact that we're still running this just-in-time system is, you know, it's a great um, um, you know, benefit to us. So we're going to continue to do it. That was 1997. But the difference was in 1997, that little plant went down. Only Toyota went down. Because in 1997, all those suppliers 
Toyota would not share its suppliers with Nissan or Honda. In 2007, all of 12 of the vehicle manufacturers went down because all, <laughs> I mean, this is a $3 part. This is a, uh, here's actually one of these things. It's a $3 part. And these guys uh, were all relying on the exact same factory. Uh, and it, there's not like a giant machine there. There's just a whole bunch of, of machines all in a array doing the exact same thing. You could put all those machines in one place or you could put them in 20 different places. But uh, so they decided to put them in one place. You know, so, um, you know, how, you know, technically, you know, what does this mean? You know, it's like, to understand, like, how we've moved, it's like, you know, what, the way it used to be is, is industrial systems, you know, I was just saying with the, uh, with the Japanese system, the industrial firms used to be vertically integrated. We all know that. And actually, industrial nations also used to be vertically integrated. And this is just, you know, to give a, a sense of, give us a picture of what's happened. Nowadays, you have the industrial firms increasingly share suppliers. In some cases, even though, you know, like in the United States, we got a number of different car companies selling us automobiles. At certain points down in the supply base, you're going to get to a point where they're all buying certain parts out of one place or maybe two places. So it's a pretty radically different structure. And then the same, you know, we already saw this before, but it's the same thing as you went from, you know, having a whole bunch of different systems to a single system that serves multiple countries. I mean, one way is, that, you know, this is a form of communalization that we've seen. It's a communalization among the different firms of their supply system. It's a communalization that we've seen among the countries of their supply system. The, uh, you know, what is this? I mean, if essentially, this is bad engineering because, you know, or another way to look at it is a lack of engineering because before, with the supply lines that were inside of the firms, with the supply systems that were inside of the uh, vertically integrated nation states, you had the ability for the engineers to walk up and down the assembly line and spot problems. And people were very aware of, you know, you know is there a threat to the supply system? What's happened is that at, with outsourcing and with offshoring, you've had this radical disintegration of both of these systems. And the engineering that used to be taken care of by people within the firm and by people in the nation state is now in the system, and no one is looking at it at all. Now, the, um, and the other thing is that not only is no one looking at it, but we're still running the system based on the supposition that it's organized in the previous way. So, you know, we could have, in any one of these systems, you could build a system to, like, dampen risk, to localize risk, to prevent the transmission of, of shock, and we've done the exact opposite. We've built a system in which a shock any place is a shock every place. In some cases, you actually amplify the shock as you transmit it. And there's actually something that makes it even potentially worse which is this issue of these, that being the fact that this is a system that is shared by a bunch of different nation states, you have the possibility for, to use this system for coercion. We just saw this last week in this spat between China and Japan over these islands. Now, you know, the J Japanese, you know, which actually patrol these islands, they arrested this trawler captain they brought him back to Japan. They said they were going to, to uh, sort of uh, prosecute him. And the Chinese, among the various other actions, they shut off the supply of rare earth metals to Japan, which I know that the, you know, Toyota, which has the ear of, uh, of Tokyo, that's something that really upsets Toyota a lot <laughs> because it's uh, something that will shut down their assembly lines for a long time. 
So here's a case in which, and this was something I was surprised the Chinese did this because, I mean, I've been expecting this. I've actually I predicted this in, 19, in 2002 in an article I wrote for Harper's. But you know, I was surprised that China did it now because it's uh, something that the, China, the Japanese, um, it's leading them to do a number of things like uh, uh, work with Mongolia to open up a rare earth uh, um, mine there. It's uh, leading them to continue their actions of keeping uh, their systems largely separate from the, the uh, Chinese. I mean, the, the Japanese rely on China for very little. You know, they don't rely on them for food. They don't rely on them for key industrial parts. Rare earths were something they just couldn't get anyplace else. The, um, I was surprised also because it, what may although this, it may take a little while for the United States to wake up, but this is a warning to the United States <laughs> that the system is not the market system that we thought it was. Uh, but the thing about the United States is that we are next. When the Chinese decide to exercise this power, um, which they just used against the Japanese, we're next in line. Next time that we do something that they, uh, the Chinese disagree with, they have the ability to essentially shut down a number of systems on which we rely. Uh, one of them, you know, 90% of the drug, the chemicals that go in our drugs in the United States, 90% come out of China. 100% of the vitamin C, ascorbic acid, ascorbic acid is what you put into the, uh, all of the processed foods, all of the stored foods that are on, on, on store shelves, it, it, you use it as a preservative. 100% of the vitamin C ascorbic acid that's used in the United States now comes out of China. I mean, in the case of ascorbic acid, this is something that was first identified by an American scientist. It was first synthesized by an American scientist. It was first mass produced by an American company. 100% of it comes out of China right now. So when the United States next, <laughs> you know, there is this issue of, you know, we're just looking at these complex systems but, you know, so the, the, tech, the temptation, the danger is that the Chinese will do something that will not create a, a crash. But still there is this temptation because they know that they can do things, shut valves off today, which will create an immediate sense of fear and panic in the United States. And if they need to study how this is done and how it's been done in the past, they just have to look at the Suez crisis of 1956 when the United States showed the world exactly how you can force people to, say, pull out of Egypt when you don't want them in Egypt. In, the, in that case, it was the United States threatened to do a few things. They threatened to crash the British pound because, as, as some of you may remember, the, there was the, when Nasser, um, the president of Egypt, when he nationalized the canal the Suez Canal in 1956, the French and British got together with the Israelis and invaded the canals area and took, uh, took control of the, of the zone. But the United States was afraid that this would lead to nuclear confrontation with the Soviets. So we tried to shut, we shut it down and we did it by threatening to crash the pound, by shutting off oil. We were actually an oil export at that point. We shut off oil supplies to Europe. And uh, so those were, proved to be pretty effective threats, managed to get the British and French to abandon that little expedition. <laughs> and if you notice in this picture, you've got these little sort of ropes showing you know, who's in charge, these uh, systems of levers that shows who's in charge. Well, that right now happens to be the, in Beijing. But again, the problem is not that the problem that Beijing will actually force us to engage in some fantastically humiliating retreat. That's just the, that's only one of the problems. The other potential problem is that in the process, we will overreact, they will overreact, someone will make a decision that triggers an, a catastrophic shutdown, a, a set of industrial crashes. You know, we can, I can go through, there's all these different events, all these different scenarios we could think of that might crash the present system. I mean, you could have something go on in North Korea, South Korea. Uh, it could be something, uh, 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 it could be a natural disaster. Um, you know, it's like the likelihood of any one of these events taking place, any one taking place in the next year is quite small. 
But as we know with the black swan type events, there's always events we haven't even imagined that could take place. If you add them all up, the likelihood of some sort of major event triggering in a crash uh, is quite high. Remember the first major industrial crash in 1999, and since then we've seen probably, you know, I could count out 10 um, significant crashes since then. So, the, you know, at some point, something is going to trigger an event that's going to be really hard to control. You know, so how did this happen? The, um, my interpretation of how this happened is that we in the United States let the monopolists out of the box. And, uh, you know, just before, so I, we, you know, understand when I use the word monopoly, I'm going to uh, define the word monopoly, and I'm going to use Milton Friedman's uh, definition. This is from his book, uh, uh, Capitalism and Freedom, from 1962. Because a monopoly is any concentration of power by one or a few firms or individuals that allows them to determine significantly the terms on which individuals can buy or sell some product or service. So it doesn't mean that you have 100% control. It just means that you have sufficient power to to de determine the terms on which deals are done. You know, for in the United States for 200 years, from the Tea Party 19, in 1773, for more than 200 years, anti-monopoly was our primary set of laws that we used to regulate the political economy. It, after the Second World War, when we had the ability to, to reshape the European political economy and the Asian political economy. Anti-monopoly law was one of the, the main laws that we sort of advocated that the Europeans adopt, or to some extent forced Europe to adopt. And it was uh, certainly something that was imposed in, in, on uh, Japan through the Japanese Constitution, which uh, was written by Americans. The, um, in 1981, Ronald Reagan, the Reagan administration essentially overthrew America's anti-monopoly laws. I mean, they didn't actually take the laws off the books. What they did is before 1981, there had been a sort of a very simple uh, you know, set of principles. It was the idea that we'd have competition for the sake of competition, that in most cases you'd have open markets. You'd strive to have open markets. What the, the new frame that was put into place in 1981, it was called consumer welfare. That's still the frame that's in, in place here. It's largely, the, I mean, in the United States, it's largely the frame that's been uh, adopted in the UK, although maybe there's some sense that the Conservative Party there may move in a different direction. There's been this big battle in, in, in uh, Brussels over uh, consumer welfare. It's been it seems to have largely gone in, the fa in favor of the consumer welfare frame. But we have to understand that the consumer welfare frame, what it really is, is just the old efficiency argument repackaged. The, in 19th century plutocratic America, people like John D. Rockefeller, people like um, Mr. Morgan, the banker, these guys would say, well, you know, competition is very wasteful. We don't want to have competition. Competition leads to all these negative effects. It's much more efficient to have all of this power concentrated in my hands. <laughs> you know, it was essentially what Louis XIV had said. It was essentially the same argument that the Marxists, the Leninists, the Stalinist would uh, make later. It's essentially the same argument that uh, folks in the United States, like in Walmart, the, uh, that's the this basic argument that they make now to justify their concentration of sufficient power to control, in some cases, over 50% of the sales of certain products in the United States. One company, country of 300 million people, over 50%. So anyway, it's like the efficiency argument, consumer welfare, once you, uh, once you accept the consumer welfare frame, you've accepted the efficiency frame. Once you've accepted the efficiency frame, you're pretty much on a straight line path to monopoly. And with the American monopolists, once they got out of the bag, once you had this 
when you started to take apart the industrial systems that we looked at before, then what you had is, it, we thought there was this, a lot of writing in the mid-1990s when, they were take, when people first started to do all this outsourcing, this disintegration of these vertically integrated systems, and they said, oh, well, we're going to have so much more flexibility. We're going to have General Motors going to be able to work with you know, Ford supplier, and Ford's going to be able to work with Toyota supplier which was true for about you know, two years. But then what happened is because you had changed the law, all these people came in and started to buy up these supply systems. And there's one case, it's uh, in my book, I write about this. One of the guys who did this within the automotive uh, system was a guy named David Stockman, who was uh, the first uh, sort of budget manager for Reagan. So uh, in the, uh, over the last decade, he was one of the main guys who did this. And he uh, built up a company called Collins and Aikman which was a monopoly supplier of all these parts to automotive uh, systems. And he actually used his monopoly power to threaten to shut down the OEMs, the big companies, so he could carve money out of them. Now, internationally, we again also let the monopolist out of the bag. This was done by President Clinton. It was done through the WTO agreement. It was done when, you know, until 1994, the system of, of, of liberal trade that was put into place in the post-war period, it relied on a conscious hegemon <laughs> operating the system. And just a, here's a, how, this is just one case of like how the central hegemon made sure that no foreign monopolist, mercantilists, were able to concentrate power over key supplies. In the 1980s, after IBM had broken open, under antitrust pressure, after IBM had broken open its uh, uh, personal computer, the PC, and all these little components were out there um, to be, um, you know, made by, uh, manufactured by different companies, Japanese made a play to grab hold of a whole bunch of these different components, like DRAMs. And uh, they were quite far along in this process when the Reagan administration woke up to this fact. The Reagan administration reacted. And remember, Reagan was someone who preached free trade, but when they saw the Japanese doing this, they put up tariffs, they put up quotas, they created a, a subsidy to create a, a, a Semitech to create a next generation set of technologies, and they went to the trading companies, they went to HP and Compact and IBM and said, do not buy from the Japanese. Go to buy from that little company in, North, in Korea uh, called Samsung. Go buy from the, in Singapore. Go, buy, go to anywhere else. Just go someplace else, Taiwan, and buy chips from somebody else. And that's what happened. And it resulted in this spreading out of capacity. It didn't necessarily bring stuff home. It spread it out among a number of different nations. WTO system, the way the Clinton people crafted that, the way we've Basically, uh, we've uh, sort of run that from, uh, from our, uh, since then. There has been no effort, <laughs> no effort whatsoever to look to counter efforts by foreign states to concentrate capacity. The reason that Taiwan had all those chips in Sinju was because this fellow named Morris Chang took this company called TSMC and he just created a major capital play. He built these giant foundries and captured all this foundry, I mean, all this chip design work for his foundries. We did nothing about it. The Chinese, every day, they sort of target certain uh, activities. They target vitamin C. They target chemicals. We do nothing about it. There's no one home. There is a hegemon in the system. It's just not in Washington anymore. It happens to be in Beijing. You know, what's the question? Like, why? How is it that we became so blind? How is it that we haven't noticed this? Um, you could probably go on all day about this, but uh, you know, I'm just going to throw out three ideas real quick. Part of it is that we rely on economists to do our thinking about economics for us. You know, the 
modern economics profession <laughs> was created, uh, to some extent, was, uh, uh, was created to hide the use of power. You know, it's like when there used to be this thing called the political economy. We understood that basically everything that takes place in the political economy is someone directly acting on someone else or someone using an institution to act on someone else. Now, the economics profession basically exists to say, oh, no, this is a series of neutral exchanges. It's a bunch of market actions. And um, so one of the things that has happened is that as we have moved more and more and more to relying on economists to interpret what's going on in our world for us, we don't see what's actually taking place in the real world. You know, there's this event at the end of The Wizard of Oz when um, the... Uh, you know, all this magic, all this power has been exercised, or, you know, around the people in the movie. And they get inside the, the, the palace, and then they open up this curtain, and they find a little man inside there pulling some levers. You know, what the economics profession does is it provides the curtain that hides the people pulling the levers. So that's one of the reasons that we haven't seen this, because we don't use our own eyes, we don't use our own common sense to look at what's going on around us. Second reason I'm going to throw out today is we have a crisis of ownership. We've had seen so much concentration of capacity, I mean, of, 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 the, you know, of, of ownership in so few hands. Ownership over the actual production, ownership over farms, ownership over the retail in, in this town or that town. It used to be largely in the United States, it, it was concentrated in people who lived in that community, who lived in that state, who lived in that region. Over the past 30 years, we've seen basically all real control centralized on just, you know, for sake of simplicity in Wall Street. So the people, you know, and the people on Wall Street, even though they actually control these systems, they technically control these systems, they have no ability to understand how the systems work. They may control Motorola, they may control um, a, a large corporation like General Electric, but they do not have any understanding of what goes on inside there. So therefore, they at use their power in ways that may lead to the destruction of important assets and important systems without even understanding what they do. Third reason, you know, today, uh, a lot of people in these systems, the people who actually understand what's going on, and I've spoken to all of these engineers who know exactly what's going on. I've talked to all of these uh, scientists who know exactly what's going on, but these people lack the voice to say anything. These people live in fear. If you raise your voice within the present day corporate systems and you say there's something wrong with this, that's pretty much a way to end your career. I mean, fear in the United States, there has been so much power concentrated in these large corporations. And this is not just true of the people who are going to warn us about the way in which these systems don't function anymore, but it's also even just like a guy who's trying to grow his own chickens or grow his own pigs or, or sell books in the United States. I spend a lot of time talking to people who actually try and make things in the United States. And they are constantly fighting these giant powers. It might be Smithfield. Packers, or it might be Amazon, uh, you know, but there's these companies that essentially control an entire marketplace. And if you raise your voice in public against the people who control the marketplace, you're pretty much the next day, you're cut out from the marketplace. And this has actually happened to one of the biggest publishers in the Western world last uh, earlier this year. They, uh, they questioned Amazon's control of the marketplace for books in the United States, this is Macmillan, and they were cut off for two weeks from access to their readers, for their customers, cut off for two weeks and thereabouts. So the people who actually understand what's going on, the people who actually make the products we rely on, who run the systems we rely on, do not speak up because if they speak up, it's over. So uh, what to do? You know, with my first book, I came out with this complex idea for uh, building resiliency back into these systems. 
And then I realized, uh, and I, you know, I was invited into some pretty high-level places. You know, I was invited into the Treasury Department under Secretary Snow in 2006. It was all the top people were there. And at the end of my little presentation, the folks said, you know what, Mr. Lin, we're conservatives in this room. And I said, yeah, I, I know that. And, you know, as, as conservatives, uh, we believe you got to make a hell of a good case to uh, before we're going to interfere in the economy. And I said, yeah, I know that. And they go, you've made a hell of a good case, Mr. Lin. And uh, pretty soon thereafter, like about two weeks later, they were all fired. And... Uh, <laughs> these guys who actually wanted to work with me. And we, uh, uh, Mr. Snow's team, he was an industrialist, or he had a bunch of industrial uh, uh, people who came out of industry who worked with him. He was replaced by Mr. Paulson, who came out, out of, uh, off of Wall Street. And Mr. Paulson, you know, those Wall Street dudes we all know, they've done a really marvelous job of, of uh, sort of uh, taking care of all risk. Um, so I was no longer invited back, uh, you know. This is not something, since the Obama administration has been largely run by Wall Street people, they're not that keen, you know, these are not the kind of risks they understand or see. Um, so because of that, I said, well, maybe the way to this is not by appealing to the elite, but actually by appealing to the people. So actually my second book, which came out relatively recently, is a more an appeal to just the American population about, you know, we need to stand up and fight these monopolies. And if we do decide to stand up and fight these monopolies that are closing these our markets, that are concentrating all this power over us, that are deranging, destabilizing the systems on which we rely, that are selling the independence of our republic to Beijing, then we'll find that we actually have a pretty good tradition with which to reconnect a pretty good set of teachers from whom to learn. And it's the American Democratic Republican tradition, which was the one that traces back not to Hamilton, not to Teddy Roosevelt and the other people who believed in concentrating power, but to the people who believed in decentralizing power. And that would be Jefferson and Madison and Lincoln. And this is the guy in the 20, 20th century who updated American democratic republicanism for the industrial era. This is Louis Brandeis, who was the uh, justice on the Supreme Court. Um, and he was sort of a, one of the, sort of the Madison of the 20th century. So anyway, that's my answer now, because I don't see the folks in the elite fixing this. They're out of control. Uh, they don't even have a sense of you know, what they do. Um, so anyway, that's my end. So, but thank you.